Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And today we're going to talk about the complex amalgam. And this is a three-part series. So let's take a look at what a complex amalgam is. And usually it's something like this that replaces one or more cusp on the tooth. It can be retained by pins, it can be retained by boxes. It may in fact just cover half of a tooth, like this case. But whatever the case may be, we know that these preparations can be very tricky. Let's take a look at the complex amalgam in our first part here. And let's do a little bit of pre-prep planning because when we have a simulated defective restoration like this, which doesn't look like anything other than a horrible composite perhaps, or maybe a buildup of some kind, and we're going to remove this, we need to know where we're going to end up because we may end up removing some cusps. And in this particular case, we definitely are going to remove some cusps. So let's take a look at the marginal ridges and make sure that they're level. The embrasures are all uh, going to be duplicated. We know that the lingual cusps in this place will line up with, with each other quite nicely. And when we're finished, we're going to want to have our lingual cusps do the same. If we draw our attention over to the facial, and we're going to be replacing maybe the mesial facial cusp in this case, we're going to want to take a look at how can we determine the height of that cusp when we're finished prepping and we're starting to place amalgam. It's going to be pretty tricky. So what we'll want to do is get some reference point from the adjacent teeth, like this mesial buccal cusp on the second molar could be lined up maybe with the distal buccal cusp on the first molar, and you can see that the mesial buccal cusp on the first molar falls within that line. And that'll give us a good idea where we're going to want to place our cusp. It's nice to get the cusp exactly in this position, but if you're going to err, I would err on being a little bit shorter so that the cusp is not going to be in danger of fracturing when the occlusion is checked. We can make some assessments about the lingual side as well. And it looks like we're probably going to be removing the distal lingual cusp in this case. So we want to know where do we want to build it up to. So if you take a look at the adjacent teeth and make some determinations on cusp pipe, you can usually figure that out. Look at how these cusps all line up in a row. One, two, three. The mesial facial, distal facial, the first molar, and the mesial facial, the second molar. So when you're looking at the tooth from the side, you can get an idea of where you want to line up your cusps. So spend a minute or so taking some measurements. Some people even write these measurements down. Look at it from the side. If we're going to be reducing a facial cusp, we don't want the facial cusp sticking out facially. We want it to tuck in like it normally would if it was a natural tooth. You can use the adjacent tooth as a guide to carve your amalgam so that you're not having the amalgam blossom outward, but rather having it tuck in. The same thing applies to the lingual side. And if we're going to be replacing the distal lingual cusp here, we're going to want to have it curve back in towards the tooth. So why don't we go ahead after assessing this and let's clean this out and do the MOD preparation for this particular amalgam. Now I'm not showing all the steps to get to this point because I have a video on an MOD amalgam that you can visit. But this preparation is much larger than an ideal preparation, obviously. Look at the lingual cusp being really small, the facial on the mesial facial being really small as well. And look at the boxes, how the boxes are conservative on the lingual side but overextended on the facial side. Well, that was because the previous restoration determined the outline. So they were necessarily, this prep needed to be uh, overextended. And I think it's clear that the mesial facial cusp will be removed and so will the distal facial cusp. And we're gonna to want to remove that in such a way to give the amalgam at least 1.5 up to about two millimeters of bulk in those cusp areas. So they'll be strong and be able to handle the forces that those cusps typically have to endure. So the preparation at this point has been cleaned out, no decay, decent retention, but clearly resistance form is violated because these remaining enamel portions would fracture easily. So let's remove some cusps. And how do we do that? Well, there are many different ways. Some people use a diamond, a carbide burr. You can use the burr straight up and down and make little slits called pages. Uh, I'm just gonna show with a straight fissure burr, 
removing the cusp by just chopping straight down into the cusp with about a one millimeter initial cut. This is a really small straight for Fisher burr. It's a 55, so it's pretty small. I think this burr is a little smaller than I would typically use. But you can see that you can make the initial cut and measure how much you've taken away by going back to your probe and seeing how much room there is. And you can see here that there's not nearly enough room for amalgam to be 1.5 to 2 millimeters thick. So we're going to go ahead and continue reducing. We're going to need to include that groove. You don't want to have the margin end right in the middle of a groove. You want to include the groove. And oftentimes people will be too shallow in that groove area. So I'll show you how uh, we initially make the mistake and then how we correct that mistake. So we're just continuing to reduce that. And it's likely to be reduced all the way to the pulpal in most situations if your pulpal depth is ideal. And now you can take a look and you can see, oh yeah, there's uh, definitely a lot more space in that area for amalgam, but eh, not quite enough, particularly along that distal facial area. There looks to be about just barely a millimeter of space. So we're going to want to take the, the Fisher burr and almost create like a channel uh, where we're deepening the amalgam preparation in the area where the groove is so that when we carve this area we'll have adequate thickness. You have to sort of remember that 1.5 to 2 millimeters of bulk uh, means at all locations, not only on the cusp tip but down in the groove areas as well. So we'll spend a little bit more time getting this dialed in and we'll measure it really carefully and then we'll uh, see how we're doing. You can see that's a lot better, but still not quite enough. I don't think we're still uh, 1.5, so we're going to go once again and deepen it just a little bit more, making sure to include that groove and dropping the bird down in that area just a little bit so it almost like drops down in. And that will actually help our resistance and retention form by having a little bit of a sway or a drop in that area like you can see right here. So I think that we're in pretty good shape at this point. We can take our probe or maybe the RGS instruments and you can measure, okay, there we go. We've got a little more than 1.5. So I think we're going to be in good shape. So we'll just go ahead and maybe make some final smoothing. Okay. And I think at this point we're about completed with that. So we'll turn our attention now over to the distal lingual cusp. Now this is going to be a little bit easier to remove, but at the same time a little bit trickier because the extension on the preparation is quite minimal on the distal lingual. And if we had extended that preparation a little bit further lingually, it would have been a much easier cusp to remove. Now you can just sort of check midway through and say, oh yeah, now we're about 1.5. This is looking pretty good. And we'll just continue to remove the cusp really carefully to avoid hitting the adjacent tooth. If you want to use one of the interguards, uh, to protect the adjacent tooth in these situations. I think that that's uh, probably a pretty good idea. I uh, went ahead and did it without any interproximal protection. And you can see that I can hold the burr up here vertically and remove the tooth structure this way if I am concerned about hitting the adjacent tooth. And once again, by the time we're finished with reducing the cusp, you'll see that it's at the level of the pulpal. Using the burr obliquely like this can be helpful as well because it uh, can remove scratches and irregularities in your reduction. You are going to want to have the margins quite smooth so that the amalgam has the opportunity to create a good seal. So I think it's important to spend a little bit of time refining these large preparations even though they are huge and in some cases are just going to serve as a buildup for the eventual final restoration maybe a gold onlay or a crown or something like that. Using a chisel, and I'm using an uh, enamel hatchet that measures 1.5 millimeters, in this case, to just remove the corners. Uh, we don't want to have any sharp edges as we transition from the cusp reduction area to the box. So you want to treat that as though it was the axial pulpal and create a little bit of a bevel there. And here I'm using the secondary cutting edge of the enamel hatchet to achieve that bevel. And we're using the secondary cutting edge over here on the mesial facial also to achieve that bevel. I suppose you could use a burr 
uh, could be used, I guess, quite quite effectively for this particular purpose. Uh, but I've just uh, picked up this nice carbon steel enamel hatchet and found that it worked quite well. I wanted to do a little bit of smoothing on the pulpal as well, so I don't have any bumps or irregularities that could cause some problems in the restoration. There's a little bit of roughness there that I want to smooth out before I fill this, but I think you get the idea of how we want to have those rounded corners between boxes and wherever you've removed a cusp. You can't leave that area sharp. So now let's take a look at auxiliary retention. One might say that this prep has plenty of retention. It's got three boxes, and particularly when you consider the fact that we're going to be placing retention grooves in these three boxes. But I thought I'd show you a method for placing retention that I think could help us in making this amalgam even a little bit more stable. And it's going to use a 329 burr, and I've simulated where the enamel and the DEJ is located on this tooth. So you want to always keep these retentive areas in the dentin and about 0.5 millimeters away from the DEJ. And the 329 burr is 1.25 millimeters long and it's 0.8 millimeters, 0.7 millimeters wide. And the burr is really petite and can get into these areas very nicely and give us a nice little slot. And so you can see I've placed one slot here on the mesial facial, and then we'll put one on the distal facial. It's about a millimeter deep, but it could be a little bit deeper or maybe a little bit more shallow, depending on the situation you're in. And you don't want to extend it too wide so that it moves towards the boxes. You want to keep about a millimeter of tooth structure between the slot and the boxes. That's just a good rule of thumb. And so now you see we're just arcing along, following the DEJ, but staying inside the dentin and not getting in the enamel. Are these two little slots absolutely necessary? Oh, maybe not. But when they are necessary, it's good to know how to do them. So that's why I thought we'd show you these. Now you may think, oh, these slots, uh, oh yeah, there it is. It's about maybe a millimeter. This is a three millimeter long probe. Uh, maybe go just a little bit deeper, maybe about uh, 1.1, 1.2 millimeters here. And I'm far away from the pulp and I have no worries of hitting the pulp because I'm right at the DEJ. And you may think, oh, you, these are done. But the fact of the matter is they are not completed. They are going to require some modification. So we need to bevel these to reduce the stresses that would occur between the bulk of the amalgam and the slot location. We cannot have the amalgam have to navigate over a very sharp edge. So just like we did with the transitions between the cusp and the box areas, we're going to round this off and make a bevel all the way around that slot. Now the the easiest way I've found of doing this is just to take a four round burr and drop it down into the top of the slot and create a countersink. This is something we do in woodworking and engineering uh, uh, metal pieces all the time. So countersinking is not a concept that's really new to dentistry. Uh, it's been around uh, for quite some time in multiple areas of craftsmanship. And you can see that these little countersinks are going to give us that smoother transition between the bulk of the amalgam and the slot area itself. So I think this is going to work out quite nicely for us. So I would consider this preparation to be uh, ready to go for the restoration. It has uh, met all the requirements. Uh, we have retention grooves now in the boxes, uh, six retention grooves in this preparation, and two slots so that you can see that the boxes themselves are retentive plus the retention grooves are placed. We have slightly rounded transitions between the cusp reduction areas and the box areas, and uh, things are as smooth as they possibly can be. We want to remember now that the measurements we took initially are going to become incredibly important when we go to restore this preparation. We've got to remember where are we placing our cusp tips, where are we locating our central groove, where are we going to be locating our marginal ridges. So that's pretty much the end of this part one. Uh, stay tuned for part two and part three where we fill this tooth and carve it and then we actually in part three are going to polish it. So thanks for watching everybody. Please subscribe. Give me feedback. Take care.